All right, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the fifth session of our PowerShell class with uh, Mick Douglas, who is at Better Safety Net on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns about our uh, class series, please feel free to hit up uh, the BreakSec podcast uh, either on Twitter at, at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C, or you can uh, email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. All right, so um, I'm going to let Mick take it over, and he can add any other additional announcements. Uh, uh, just for uh, announcements for the class, next week is the solar eclipse on um, the 21st. I won't be here. I'll be in St. Louis area. So Mick will be running the whole thing by himself. I'm sure he can do it. He you know, seems to be well-versed in handling himself. Uh, I mean, handling video. Oh, God. Uh, online. I'm just going to shut up now. Go take it away, Mick. <laughs> that intro wasn't awkward at all. So anyway, uh, thanks. And uh, by the way, if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to get the uh, solar lenses. Um, there's still time to buy them uh, because it is going to be solar eclipse day. So uh, go out and get them. Even if you're not in the path of full coverage, it's going to be a cool thing to see partial coverage. Actually, yep. I plan on uh, breaking during lunch at uh, Chicago, where I'm going to be teaching at that time, and yeah. we'll uh, do a little science. Very cool. Class 14 welder's goggle uh, glass, if you can get it as well. Don't uh, accept any other substitutes. Or squint very hard and hope that you don't go blind. Yeah, we that's don't that. horrible that's advice. Idea, don't yeah. do it. Um, so uh, let's, uh, without further ado, here's uh, the link to the show notes that we will be having up after the class is done. As I mentioned at the start of the class, uh, SANS is one of the ways that I keep fed and off the streets and busy. Um, in Seattle, in the end of October, if you're looking for things to do, why not go to SANS? There's actually a couple different classes. I'm going to be teaching one of them, but there's going to be uh, multiples going on. So come on, join the party, and um, we'll have a good time. Um, also, I'll bring, uh, you know, I'll bring candy and stuff, because why not? Tis the season. So our agenda today, I wanted to chat a little bit about this. Um, for the last week, I've not received anybody's file integrity monitoring homework. So if you're still doing it and you're still paying attention to the class, please shoot me your homework if you want me to review it. Again, this class isn't graded. You don't have to do any homework. Um, uh, but a lot of folks really dug building up the FIM. And I had quite a few folks that said that like really awesome stuff, like this was the first time I coded something in years and it was way easier than I thought it would be. So um, by all means, feel free to send me stuff. I'll take a look and I'll offer advice. I'm, this is one of those things where uh, you get style points, right? There's no really right or wrong way to do this. Whatever works for you will work. Um, today we're also going to cover a thing called WMI eventing. And no, that's not a typo. Windows, just for you. Um, I'm going to do this. I am going to add to the dictionary because eventing is a real world word in the PowerShell uh, area. And we're also gonna talk about PowerShell logging and um, a very quick and easy dirty way to do this is um, just look at the longest commands and I'll show you some ways to work with that. Um, because in the interest of uh, time, when we did this the first time, um, I kind of slid past a couple of things and so we can uh, spend a little bit of, of time and focus on um, that particular command. And then I've got more homework. Some, uh, some of you were like, really like, give us more homework. So I came up with something that I think will be a real interesting one for some of you. And um, isn't that hard? It's not that difficult, but it makes a real cool um, uh, project where you can look for workstation to workstation traffic. And we'll get into all of those here in a little bit. One thing though, it was really freaky at the start of the class. Um, I had um, uh, someone in the, um, in the chat uh, was asking, you know, hey, are you going to cover uh, invoke obfuscation? And um, yeah, yeah, we are. Although we're gonna take the flip side of that and we're gonna talk about this really cool talk that happened. Um, uh, let's see, I should have this actually. 
is revoke obfuscation. So this was a talk at Black Hat um, earlier, or Hacker Summer Camp as I like to call it, where uh, Daniel uh, Bonin and Lee Holmes uh, did a talk about how to detect obfuscation. Now, I'm not going to rehash this article. Um, this um, is linked in the um, notes, so I'm not going to belabor that point. But one thing that's really, really cool about this is if you're wanting to take your attacker detection to the next level, can't say enough really good things about this. And I'll get you kind of started on this because the um, for some folks, the learning curve on this might be a little too sharp. And so I went through this and um, kind of did the, if I needed to get up and running on this like really, really fast and I didn't have time to read because like there's 20 pages, like that's way too many. Um, I mean, I understand it's supposed to be a scholarly article and all that, but ain't nobody got time to be reading all that. So what I'm going to do is um, walk you through a couple things when it comes to um, dealing with um, like detecting obfuscation uh, later on in the class today. Um, our main thing, though, is if you were paying attention to the class last time, there was a bonus section called, um, uh, uh, that we didn't really name it. It was just about uh, WMI. Uh, there were some uh, questions at the end of class, and people were saying, like, you know, what's WMI about? What can you do with it? And I want to show you just how scary and nasty WMI is. Um, what you can do with WMI is you, um, you can cause all manner of havoc. And one of them is a thing called register WMI event. And in a moment, I'm going to see if the demo gods are kind to me. And I'm going to register an evil um, WMI event. And what will happen is I've got this, this is a very gimmicked and contrived setup, but the idea is that you can launch Notepad, notepad.exe, and it will do um, pretty much whatever you want. In this case, I create an evil counter, which iterates evil, um, which is lame, but I'm deliberately making it lame, and then I'm going to show you how to find these sorts of things. So. Fingers crossed, we go into demo land. All right, so first things first, um, you're, depending on what sort of event subscriber you're going to be making, you may need to be administrator, you might not. It just depends on what you're doing. So what I've done is I've got a couple um, stub files created. So if I cd to my, whoops, oops, if I type correctly. So I've got this uh, uh, file, these two files here, uh, evil PS1, which is the fake malware. And let me, um, let me walk you through this one. This is the, the least innocuous of them. So basically I created a loop that will always work. And the idea is that it's just going to write evil and then the number, and then it'll sleep a second and write evil again. Nothing too nasty, right? But where it gets really weird is this evil subscriber. And I'm gonna walk you through how these things work because um, not enough people know about them and not enough folks really quite understand the implications of them. So, um, So what I'm doing here is this is a one-two punch in this command here. Uh, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm creating a WQL command. Now, I realize that WQL isn't strictly a PowerShell thing, but for those who really want to take their PowerShell to the next level, you're definitely going to want to burn some time on WQL. Um, I have a ton of blog postings that are... Um, uh, in the can for how WQL works and what it does and how it works and why it makes me drink. Because um, quite frankly, um, 
uh, in the group chat, go ahead and let me know if you've used WQL and uh, what you think about it. Um, I'm expecting those who have used it to have like like misery question, like saying I hate life. And part of the reason why is that it's a very punishing syntax. And if you don't get it right, it will um, give all kinds of weird errors. Um, in some cases, uh, in some instances, um, capitalization counts, which I know that's weird coming from Windows land. Um, the other thing that's um, odd about it is just how broad of a topic it is, and it's not terribly well documented. So um, this is a real quick and dirty thing, and I'm going to walk you through this. Um, everything in Windows can be worked via WQL. And what I'm doing is a good old select star. You'll find that WQL is sort of SQL-like. And what we're doing is there's a event space. WQL works off of events and um, among other things. And you will find that there are um, uh, a whole number of events. And one of them is instance creation event, which means that something was run. Like, Typically, this is used to trigger when a new program is launched. And so then there's this within one. This means that within the past second or every ch second, check to see what's been running. And is this target instance, the, the new thing that's being observed, is it a Win32 process? And yes, I realize that uh, Win64, we're on a Win64 system. but um, in this instance, everything is considered a Windows 32 um, process. And then the instance name is like Notepad. So as long as I have this query running, it's going to uh, return true if Notepad.exe or anything with the name Notepad is running in the process tree and it started within the past second. So that's the trigger event. Now, what's really freaky is this, this registered WMI event. Let me hop over to here. Um, um, registered WMI event is a whole, it, it, it's a descent into madness is quite frankly what it is because you can create WMI eventing conditions that certain things happen certain actions take place under specific conditions. Now, what's interesting about this, or at least to me, is that you can actually, if we go back to our, uh, our uh, script here, we've got this query trigger. So whenever this query comes back as true, um, we want this evil identifier script to run and our action will be to run this PS uh, evil script. So here's the weird thing that um, that at least for me uh, is now, I mean, I think I can uh, do, I have my execution recent, let's uh, get execution. Oh, restricted. Okay, let's. All right. So I'm in my evil event subscriber now. And what I need to do is I'm going to uh, run evil event subscriber. And you'll see right here that I now have this new uh, service called evil or this event uh, named evil. Now I can um, get event subscriber and you will see that I have evil running. Now, there are ways that you can create an event um, subscription that's like hidden, but um, it's really not that hidden. You can just do this force and that will show anything that's hidden. So um, that was one of the times that I thought I had like found a new elite thing and then uh, it was actually quite embarrassing because Lee Holmes was in the class. And I was like, Lee, look at this Lee thing. And he was like, oh, you could do dash force. So, wah, wah. Um, so now I've got this evil thing that's running. And check this out. All I have to do is do notepad. 
And now all of a sudden you see that my evil instance starts running. And what's really interesting, at least to me, is I can even close that notepad instance and it's still running. So it is now really, really incumbent on you to understand that you have to look for your event subscribers. If you are not looking for event subscribers, if you find that you're dealing with an adversary who's taken game to the next level, they can make a um, Windows event subscriber that will trigger on any number of instances. It can trigger on reboots. It can trigger on um, user log and user log out. It can trigger on somebody starting notepad, for instance. So when I say that finding persistence on the bad guy is tricky, you're, you're going to have to go past your services. You're going to have, have to go past your scheduled tasks. You're going to have to go past the auto runs in um, the registry. You're going to have to dig a little deeper, and this is part of that. So um, honestly, I think that there could probably be a, you know, like a whole class on nothing but persistence on Windows machines. And I would love to attend because there's plenty of different things. Um, hey. I hope this is eye-opening. Yeah, question. Yeah, hey, Mick, could you use uh, the, the Git event subscriber to mask, like, exfil data? Let's say um, you don't exfil something until somebody opens a browser so that it looks like the person actually opened the browser and then maybe traveled to that to the naughty site. Uh, or to the to the CNC site or to, to the place where it was uploaded. Is that is that something that they would use for that? Well, I mean, you could use it for whatever you want. So, like, uh, you know what? Let's give that a try. Let's, like, demo. Let's, like, we're going to go off-roading. Please be kind demo gods. Uh, <laughs> so, in your instance, you wanted it to be, like, let's say Chrome. Uh, and then um, let's do, instead of our action being this, let's do... Um, because my thought was my thought was like if the browser starts you know and you know somebody's looking for logs of odd activity if there's nothing going on in the box and then all of a sudden somebody sees something dialing or you know reaching out that would look weird but if somebody sees a user open a browser and then all of a sudden something reaches out the guy would be more likely to go well Oh, he just went to a website. That's not a problem. Oh. Well, so the th thing is, though, so here's there's a couple things. First of all, one, uh, Shaki, uh, thank you very much for pointing out that my spelling is every bit as bad as I claim it is. I misspelled Chrome, for goodness sakes. Um, it, it, there's a couple things we need to unparse here with what you're, you're saying. Um, uh, you, you, one, um, you could make it so that it came from the Chrome process or whatever other process, but you would have to do something to have PowerShell um, interact with that um, application. Um, but what you could do, like let's just say you have a lazy administrator and they're just looking at, say, network flow traffic. They're not looking at your um, event logs. Um, and we've had a couple people ask already in the chat, like, does this show in the event logs? And yes, it does. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but let's say you're just looking at the network flow level. And so if you go to some website and you want, or you load a browser up, and then you say use the um, uh, download um, object in PowerShell, like mm -hmm. the system.net.download, um, you certainly could do that. And um, PowerShell would download that particular object. So um, let's let's go off roading here for real. Um, Yep. So here's what you would do. You would. And we're not going to use the invoke web request. Let's do system dot this one. This is closer to what the bad guys do in reality. 
So um, what we're going to do is make a downloader. Um, I found that it's a little bit easier. Um, and if you're really good with um, PowerShell, you'll find that I'm, I'm definitely taking the coward's way out. Um, but you can um, actually do all of this within the um, action command. Um, but I like to have a PowerShell script itself that I'm calling just to make it a little bit easier. Um, so, oh yeah, I killed off my PowerShell. So let's. This was a great question, by the way. Let's, uh, I hope it, the payoff's there. Actually, let me cheat even more. Shameless cheats. Um, let's change our URL that we're downloading. And let's just get um, the Google robots.txt. Yep, uh, thank you. I, I uh, realize I am in the, um, I am in the, uh, the restricted mode. Okay, this looks pretty okay. Let me test it to make sure that we're good because All right, cool. So we do have So yep, we have the robots.txt file from Google via that. So let's delete that thing. So now, um, so I've got no event subscribers running. So this evil event subscriber, if I've done everything correctly, fingers crossed, um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to invoke the downloader when we fire up Chrome. Now, it's important to note what's going to happen here is the way that this is written, Chrome itself isn't going to start the, um, the download. That's going to appear to come from PowerShell. So from a hiding process, like if you're really trying to be stealthy, uh, we'll talk about improvements that you can make to this uh, technique, both from an offensive and defensive uh, notification process. But this is just a for instance kind of thing. All right, so cool. So now, if we did the, everything right, we have a new Chrome that launched. And hey, test.txt is there. Nice. So, and just to prove that this is a, a persistent thing, check this out. Git um, event subscriber. Um, we still have evil running. I close this. Um, I'm going to del delete the test.txt file again. It's not there. One more again. We run Google Chrome. Oh, I, I, I was pushing my luck. It worked once. Does it have to be invoked again? No, it should just be uh, sitting there. Um, one of the things, though, that's worth pointing out, um, let's, uh, let's go for broke here and close all uh, Chrome here. Uh, 
Okay, let's give that a try. And with luck, There we go, there it is. So this is something that you would um, need to uh, double check to um, see what's going on. There's, so this is a bit beyond the scope of this class. Um, if you folks are really interested in it, I, I could go into this. Um, there's two types of WMI eventing. There's intrinsic and extrinsic. And um, holy crap, um, it's brain bleed. I'm working on a PowerShell class for SANS that I hope gets picked up. And the WMI intrinsic versus extrinsic is about a half day module. It is yes. nasty. Um, basically, um, the difference is you with uh, WMI eventing, you want them to happen on clock ticks, not just sitting around waiting for specific things. This query that we did where we're running for, like waiting for a Chrome process to launch is actually a pretty expensive thing to do, especially depending on how you uh, craft your query. So usually you'll see uh, things happen on timing um, events. So uh, Joel K asks a great uh, question. Does the subscription persist past reboot? And the answer is, it depends on how you do this. Typically, the answer is no. What most people will do is have a um, auto run uh, that will um, put that back in, um, or they'll like kick some sort of process off that will load it back in. That's actually the preferred method because um, say you have a bad um, WMI eventing uh, subscription set up and you have it set to persist, it can cause a chicken and the egg scenario where it can be very tricky indeed to um, unregister those. I know a guy who's got two thumbs and has hosed a machine that way. So um, you, uh, I, it, most folks tend to shy away from uh, persistent uh, reboots. Yeah, laugh it up, laugh it up. Um, so um, hopefully that gives you guys an interesting uh, insight into these. Again, to take a look at them, you just do get um, event subscriber, and then um, uh, they can be removed um, using uh, remove, uh, remove. remove event, and then I think it's uh, name evil, like that. Uh, let's, of course, the demo fails. Hold on a second. Let me There is a way to get rid of those. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not, it's unregister because that's totally intuitive. Unregister event, and then just the name. And now when we do, it's no longer there. So that's the process uh, by doing it. So I'll, um, I'll update that. Let me put this into the slide. There we go. So that's WMI eventing. Not enough people know about it and it's super freaky. Watch uh, or read this, um, read this um, story here because it's really cool. Okay, so next thing, um, odd process items. So um, this kind of neatly fits into WMI eventing because a lot of times attackers will put some of their more convoluted um, PowerShell commands in um, WMI event registers because they look very weird. And so what you need to start doing is getting in the habit of looking for event ID 4688, which is the um, uh, process um, monitoring one. And so what you want to do is, as a defender, you wanna see all the 4688s that are going on. The easiest way to do this is to use our good pal event viewer uh, control copy your XML uh, query. 
So uh, we're no longer in uh, this demo. And so you simply do XML equals, and our extended quote again, for those who don't remember, is at sign single tick your string, and then you do single quote again, and at sign again, you double check to make sure that it was loaded as you expect. And then you simply search for it using git win event filter XML, and then you put your XML in here. And this is a super fast, oh, I'm not admin. Bear with me for just a second. Now, this should work better. So they say repetition is good for uh, learning. So I'm about to learn a little bit better. Um, so XML equals Okay, so get win event. All right, cool. So now we see all of our different things. But there's a problem. Let me highlight this even a little bit better. Um, we have this message now that says a new process was created, blah, 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 and then dot, dot, dot. Because what uh, PowerShell is saying is this event is longer than we can display at the command line and yawn, that's weak stuff, that's boring. So we're gonna fix that real quick and easy. The way you do this is you do select extended property, whichever properties you want. And now all of a sudden hold on to your socks. Boom! full everything that you need and it just goes on and on and on and on and now you can parse it to your heart's content would that and be so, something you'd want to use streamwriter for and then uh, you know that way you wouldn't have the output like this yeah this is just more of showing um, one way of uh, yeah. forcing this um, I find it to be kind of a very quick and dirty way of debugging scripts mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks have noticed that despite me saying you shouldn't use like right host or whatever. I yeah. don't shy away from using it from like proof of concept things and you shouldn't either because quite frankly, it, it gets the job done. Cool. So now what's really cool about this is now you have, you can parse this thing to your heart's content really and you know, start uh, filtering strings like say you're worried about the invocation of this uh, command, you know, or how, who was doing it or how or whatever. And so um, I don't know what you're looking for um, if you're doing it this way, but what I am saying is if you need it, this is how you go about getting it and you can absolutely positively get every single thing. Uh, this is kind of a flashback to, I think it was the first or second session. Um, I showed WMI or get uh, win event and I kind of tap danced around uh, this and so I'm showing you every single thing you would ever want to potentially have about this. Oh, can I put this in the chat? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the command is going to be um, git, wm, git win event filter XML. Now, remember, I've put my XML into an XML variable, and then it's pipe select object, and it's, you, you can either do select or select object. Um, select object is the most official way. Um, ex, expand property and then name of property. So in this instance, um, you know, we could have put, um, here, let's, Here's the default properties that you're seeing. You know, time created the ID, the level display name and message. You really only need to expand out the message because that's the big honking one. And Bill, you're welcome. Thank you for asking such an awesome question. 
Um, so this allows you to have full you know, access to everything that you would possibly want and more. I don't know if I would um, go about doing this for parsing things um, at scale. Um, if I were, you, you have to be very careful about um, um, how you go about parsing this and, and handling this because the concern that I have here is that, you know, how much data is in the Windows event log, right? Like the answer is, all of it, like the Windows event log can be huge. So um, be sure to test this in a non-production environment. And here's a pro tip for me to you, be sure to select what you're after first and truncate that all out before writing it to disk because I've, um, yeah, I filled up a, <laughs> a pretty sizable partition once uh, trying to do uh, some research and analysis uh, for a client. So, um, yeah, learn from my mistakes is basically what I'm saying on that uh, uh, quick power tip. Now, here comes the homework. This one's a fun one. And you actually have a couple different ways of um, approaching this if you so choose. Um, one option that you can have is the truly PowerShell method. Um, the other is you can use the Windows um, net trace method. And which one works um, will largely be up to you. I don't really care which tool you use to start the tracing and work the tracing, as long as you have the tracing. Many organizations are really good about um, tracking when um, uh, traffic goes north, south, or traverses outside of a subnet, um, but a lot of organizations can't see intra-subnet traffic. So as long as it's machine-to-machine -machine traffic, um, people in like sales can talk to one another all the time. And that's a real big problem because most malware that we're seeing, most attack tools, um, are able to spread like wildfire through networks because nobody's seeing that east-west traffic or that workstation to workstation traffic. And so what I've got for you guys is a pretty interesting start to a bit of homework. And this is in the show notes. So um, I'll be posting these up online very soon. Um, this is how to go about packet um, sniffing within PowerShell. Oh, thank you, Brian, for posting that in the chat. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can set this up. PowerShell is just one of them. Um, and, you know, we're, we're doing some uh, cool uh, PowerShell shenanigans, so PowerShell might be the way to go. However, some of you are, um, you know, more in line with the old uh, CMD method, and you might be more familiar with the net sh trace command. And um, for those that you of you who aren't, um, this uh, net trace is a, um, it's the same thing sort of as what we're doing with these PowerShell commands. Um, the thing that's weird is, and a lot of folks don't know about this, Windows has built-in packet capture. So that's crazy if you think about it. Um, yeah, TCP dump was good enough for grandpa and it's good enough for me. You're betraying how you're a young in there, uh, Mr. Brake. Um, back in my day, <laughs> packet capture devices were inline systems that oh, wow. um, required a uh, interruption in network services or a spam port because we didn't have our fancy TCP dump or Wireshark. Like I remember when Ethereal came out and I was overjoyed. So bow to your beardiness. Ugh, I'm an old geezer, and I'm not even 42 yet. So, yeah. Um, so, the, I guess the moral of the story is there's always someone who's angrier and older and crotchet or crotchetier or whatever. Um, but what the goal of this homework is going to be is this. I want you guys to either using um, net sh trace, um, net sh trace, you would do it this way, net sh uh, start like so and this will give you the different command line options for how you would start a NetSH. Now I, I want to be very forthright even though this is a PowerShell class if you're f this is your first um, entry into doing packet capture on a Windows system you may want to consider using the NetSH 
trace method. And the reason why is this I find a little bit easier to use because it includes things like this. Uh, where is it? I wanted to highlight it. Here's one of the things that's nice. Persistent yes, no. What this means is your packet trace will restart at reboot. So that's a very handy thing. So packet uh, persistent yes means that when you restart the machine, the trace uh, starts right over again. Um, the other thing that's really nice here is this file mode. What you're gonna need to do is set it to um, uh, do a file-based cap, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, uh, file-based capture, and you're gonna want to pick circular, which means that once you hit a certain size, it will just rotate over. Um, that way you're not filling up the hard drive. So that's one thing to um, ponder. The other thing though, if you want to go with um, the uh, PowerShell methods, um, they walk you through the different processes that you use in order to get the, this started. Um, just the, the one thing that I will um, want to point out is this. These providers um, are really powerful spend some time playing with them. Even if you're not doing it using PowerShell, I would encourage you to look at this. And then there's this other thing that I wanna focus on for the rest of our um, session here. I'm kinda of skipping forward a couple slides. Built-in traces. This is quite possibly one of the saddest things in TechNet that like this should have 11 million page views and like, Clippy should be dancing across the top of this, or maybe you shouldn't be, but I'm just saying this is a really freaking cool page because what you can do within the um, uh, NetSH trace and also the PowerShell trace is you can use these built-in trace scenarios. Again, thank you um, for posting that. Um, but the links will be, uh, for those of you who are watching um, uh, not live, um, these links are going to be up on the uh, website. Uh, you can get it where you got the other uh, prezos. Um, what this, what, what's amazing about this, and I, I kid you not, this is one of those the like eye popping golden things. A couple of years ago, when I found this thing, I flipped my lid. I was absolutely in awe because they have for you pre built trace scenarios, and these are named. So what you would do is, um, remember how I said there's that provider name? Um, what you would do is you reference that provider name and then it actually does this um, capture based off of these particular conditions for you. So, and these keep going on and on and on and on. And it's amazing because you can do like crazy uh, shorthands and like, you know, grab like unencrypted IPsec tunnel traffics, for instance. You can do things like grab um, the pre-encryption for HTTPS. I mean, it's, it's lovely. Um, there's one in here that's really fun where, um, let's, uh, whoops. Um, you can capture only the header information if you're like concerned about a particular uh, type of uh, provider or per type of info. Now, I will grant you, these names are very long and unwieldy, um, but fortunately we've got this lookup tool. So um, take a look at this. This will make life easier. Right? They're pen testers, um, and some of you probably are. You may want to take a look at this because um, this would make a dynamite post-exploitation uh, uh, system if you uh, set up a packet capture where you're recording certain uh, network flows that are interesting. So um, take a look at this. I think you'll really find this very powerful and a lot of fun. So um, that's about it that I've got for today. Um, I want to spend a couple minutes uh, doing q and I hope that you guys take me up on this challenge. If you don't 
don't worry. Uh, this isn't for a score. This isn't for a grade. And I'll be uh, posting uh, these things, um, my versions of them, up in the weeks and months to come. Um, this actually, um, the file integrity monitoring uh, one that we did uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, this are going to be part of my uh, DerbyCon talk on uh, PowerShell for incident response, which, funnily enough, that's what we're talking about. So cool. go figure. So Mick, the, uh, the persistence on the, uh, the, the NetSH trace, uh, does that run as the user that invoked it originally when it, on, on reboot or will yes. it? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, it what? runs as the, uh, under the user context. Now, um, bear in mind that your what you can see pretty much is going to force you to be doing that as an administrator user. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pretty much have to use that. Well, my, my wonder was, what if you don't get logged back in? Does, you know, does that continue to run and take up resources? Or will it stop eventually? Oh. That's an outstanding question. Um, what's even more outstanding is where does Windows cache those credentials? Yeah. I don't know. That, I'm actually, hold on a second. got to write this down. I was wondering about if you could run a Mimi Cats or something like that to pull that information out of, uh, out of, out of memory. Um, well, so here's the thing that's ugly about this, right? Like, I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, it's actually going to be worse than that. It's not in memory when you do the reboot. Yeah. So it's either going to have to pull it from some sort of a credential cache or it's written to like a System. registry or oh. something. <clears throat> so, um, I'm gonna have to um, do some. Um, I'm gonna have to do some analysis on that. That'll be a really good uh, like update uh, slide for next week because I, I legit don't know where that's coming from. Yeah. Um, well, I was just wondering because if it didn't have the credentials initially on startup on reboot, would it run as something like system or would it run with elevated privileges until you logged in and then it would drop down maybe or something? I don't know. I, I was just wondering, spitballing. I I simply don't know. More ammo to use laps and run the trace with that. Oh. Hell yes. Uh, it Honestly, um, laps is quite frankly one of the best things since sliced bread. And the fact that I don't run into it every single time I'm either doing a pen test or an incident response means that we haven't got the word out good enough. Mm. Laps is amazing. Okay. <clears throat> So does anybody have any questions or comments for, for Mick? Yeah, I get a question on the, uh, capturing the traces and stuff like that. So that's good for capturing um, basically the promiscuous traffic on a single host. Uh, what about just if you're logging all like the network connections and stuff like that, um, either through the security event viewer or Sysmon or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you could certainly do that. Um, uh, I mean, gosh, there's plenty of different ways that you could do this. Shoot, you could even just like do a uh, like a run uh, netstat on a on a frequent interval and write it to a file. Um, you could run Kanza every 30 seconds across your domain. Like, there's plenty of ways of doing that. Um, uh, Sysmon probably would be the <laughs> most sensical way, um, but um, there's a lot of, of different approaches that you could do uh, for that. Um, quite frankly. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I don't care necessarily how you do it, just as long as you've got it and it doesn't impose too much of a burden on your machines. Um, all too often I go and do an incident response and I say, so, you know, who talks to who? And they're just like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, is it weird that this machine's talking to that machine? And they're like, but we don't know. So anything that you can do to get any kind of baseline would be hugely appreciated. And does that kind of answer your question? I feel like that was a bit of a cop out. Yeah, it, it's good. I guess I was thinking more of how they capture things differently. Would you be missing certain things by monitoring either through Sysmon or the security internet connections? Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, yes. So 
it, depending on what you're capturing and how you're capturing it, you could get some different views on things. Um, so Sysmon would give you a very authoritative view on a lot of different components that are, um, that are working together for a particular socket connection. Um, but, you know, you don't have to use just this one. I mean, um, like a lot of folks, a lot of folks forget about good old Netstat, uh, NAOB, which will get you all the programs and all the DLLs associated with a particular, or all the um, programs associated with a particular um, PID. So, um, I don't know. It, it just really depends on what you're after. I, again, cool. I don't have, as long as you have it I, is what I'm more interested in. I'll just take IP to, you know, like source host, source des, uh, port to destination host and destination um, port. Like that, it, that would be a huge improvement over what most folks have. Nice. All right. So does anybody else have any uh, questions? I am going to take silence as no. Okay. Well, okay. before uh, we shut things off, I want to say a big thank you for everyone who shot me uh, the questions that kind of formulated and informed tonight's session. If there's any last uh, things that you want me to talk about before our final session, please let me know. And I want to point out, even though it's our final like scheduled session, I probably will be doing bonus sessions. You know, I'll, I'll need a couple weeks off and stuff. Uh, and there's going to be blog postings and stuff in the Slack, but um, I'm having way too much fun to stop now. <laughs> cool. I, I would, if you want to continue on, we'll let you do as much as you want, you know, we'll post them and, you know, give them as much bumpage as we can. So, <clears throat> All right. Well, that was it for uh, for session five uh, with with Mick here. Uh, at Better Safety Net on Twitter, uh, at BreakSec on Twitter. Uh, you can also join our Slack uh, at BreakSec.signup.team. And uh, yeah, that was it for this week. <laughs>